We're back, and there are any number of issues that are going on up in Washington. And joining us at this time is Senator Bill Cassidy to talk about these issues. Senator, welcome to the show. Hey, Newell. Thank you for having me, man. First, let me congratulate you. Uh, One, the president signed a law to lower drug prices and end gag orders against pharmacists. And I know that a number of people have been working towards that end, and it seems as though the president signed a bill. That's fantastic, because really the idea started with Louisiana pharmacists coming to Washington, D.C. and telling me, you know, insurance companies tell me I cannot tell a patient that it's cheaper to pay cash than to pay their insurance copay. I kind of put my finger in my ears and make sure it's not plugged with wax. Wait, (laughs) what happens if you tell them? And they say, we lose our contract with the PBM, with the pharmacy benefit manager. Right. I don't, I don't got the margins to, to forego a big chunk of business, so I can't tell them. And it began with representative democracy, people coming and saying, listen, this is a problem. And it culminated with the president signing into law. So it's good news. Well, you and I talked about that before. It just didn't make any sense. It, it, it was just like crazy. And when you think about the number of folks that are living paycheck to paycheck, if they can save $5, $10, they want to save it. Absolutely, Newell. And the problem is that health care is just rife with this. There's so many examples of, as a doctor who works in the charity hospital system, of course I'm aware of it, but anybody that's interacted with the healthcare system knows that there's lots of examples of where all the information on price is on the side of the provider and the, and the, and the patient, the consumer, has no information about price. And, and she gets the bill six weeks later, she thinks, wow, how did it cost that much? And maybe she finds out that she could have gone down the street and gotten it for, you know, a tenth of the cost. That actually happened. But she didn't know because she had no information about price. We're trying to change that. Let me also congratulate you on uh, I think you're going to be suspending the rules to try and bring forward a bipartisan bill to reduce student loan debt and make basically to to create a, a uh, communication process that's transparent to, to let these young students know this is what's going to happen to you. This is what you want to study. And this is the kind of return on this investment that you can expect. Totally. That's another example where the facts about the price are typically hidden from the consumer. In this case, the, the student and his or her family. So a kid signs up, wants to go off to college, doesn't realize that the student A that she is, she's getting or he's getting is going to put them in debt, maybe $250,000 nor do they realize that if they go into a certain line of study, they may only make $30,000 when they graduate. Now, the institution doesn't care. They're putting the money in the bank. But the student and the family would obviously care if they had the information. So we're kind of pushing out that that if a child, a student goes to a college or whatever one it is, uh, what can they expect to make when they graduate? not just graduating from that college, but from the specific program, say petroleum engineering versus gender studies. What are they going to learn and what are they going to earn? And then, by the way, what's the total cost, including not just tuition, but room and board and books and fees? We're trying to get that to the students so that the student can make the educated decision. More and more you hear about kids that that come out and they can't get a job that has an annual income that even reaches 50 percent of one year's tuition. Totally. And, and, uh, and if they knew that going in, by the way, we also want them to know there are some programs that do a really good job helping, say, for example, African-Americans. And if you go to this school, you're going to have a 90 percent graduation rate. And if you go to another school, it may only be 30 uh, percent. So, and they deliberately have programs that are going to help students who might be a veteran, who might be a single mom. What do they? So you can put in your particular characteristic and find out how well that university does in helping you get through. And by the way, you'll know what you're going to graduate the first year or two after you get out, what you're going to earn first two years out of graduation, and is it worth it to you relative to the amount of debt you're taking on? Well, hopefully these are two bills that have bipartisan support because oftentimes we think that this actually never happens in D.C. Now, I know it absolutely is bipartisan, and we're getting folks who are concerned about the issue. I think John Cornyn, who is from Texas, who's a second-ranking Republican, and we have Dick Durbin, who's the second-ranking Democrat from Illinois. 
um, their co-sponsors. Uh, and I think we, oh, I'm not sure, are uh, Orrin Hatch and Elizabeth Warren, who are quite the opposite end of the political spectrum, but they both recognize that this is a great bill for students. And so one of the most conservative and one of the most liberal senators has signed on to support. So that's the kind of approach we're taking. In light of the coverage of the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, we wouldn't think that any of y'all are talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you're shouting. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say, you know, first, I, I, I thought he needed to be confirmed. And uh, I, I thought that uh, the committee, uh, Senator Grassley, did a great job. But I did want to commend you uh, for challenging those that were kind of in your face, uh, trying to create a moment for purposes of the television and the video that's being shot. Because none of these people uh, travel around without somebody videoing it and putting it on FaceTime Live or what, or Facebook Live or whatever it would be, um, you know, and, and just started asking questions of them. And, it, and what, re- what it revealed is that they don't know much of what they're talking about. Well, they don't care. Um, but this program that you and I are going on right now is a discussion. And people can call in and they can voice, but it is a discussion. It's just not a diatribe. And it, but, and so we started off about pharmacists coming to Washington, D.C. and telling me how this is a problem. And that discussion led to the president signing a law banning gag clauses. It just doesn't advance anything when people are just yelling talking points and they don't care what the truth is and they don't care to have a discussion they just want to yell their talking points for social media. I'm totally with you on that. One thing that has just confused me, Senator, is that this uh, can't be for whatever reason when the folks from the left are talking about Kavanaugh, a specific uh, details about th- this incident that why does it have to have these overarching effects that they can't connect these dots? You know, uh, folks know their talking points and they are going to yell them and they don't care about the truth, uh, or they don't care perhaps that there's no corroboration, or they don't care that the accuser's best friend says that it didn't happen. Um, uh, and, and ultimately, Kavanaugh became a litmus test. It is awful if any woman has ever, or any man has ever sexually approached in a way they do not wish to be approached. It is awful, um, particularly when it's associated with, with force. Um, but but you got to have somebody who's agreeing to it, or else we become like Stalinistic Russia, where as the as the Stalin's KGB director said, "Show me the person, I'll tell you the crime." Uh, you just can't have that in the United States of America. You got to have some sense of fairness. You, a law enforcement official and a lawyer, of course, know that so well. But some folks on the left opposing Kavanaugh wanted to forget it. Well, it seems as though they said that you wanted to stymie the voices of victims and women and the, and the laws that have been passed in this country, across this country, both at state and federal levels, don't. In fact, to the contrary, the simple allegation can create the wheels of justice to start turning very much unlike most other crimes. Yes, and and we want to be and must be so sensitive to victims of crimes but you have to balance that with you can't just accuse somebody and with even your best friend saying it didn't happen, uh, assumed to be correct. Right. It, uh, it requires corroboration, but still you get the opportunity of, you know, uh, the justice officials and everyone else looking into it. it you know, but it, the message is if you're the victim, you need to report the crime. And I, and I do and totally. But I also will say that there was clearly an intent to destroy Kavanaugh. And one of Stephen Colbert's writers tweeted, I'm sure glad we destroyed Kavanaugh. She took the tweet down when she got a lot of blowback. But uh, there was a stated intent to destroy Brett Kavanaugh. Why? Because folks disagree with his judicial philosophy. Uh, Specifically, they fear that because he is a conservative, he will he will vote against things that they care deeply about, like, for example, abortion rights, Um, prejudging him no matter what he says. I thought Susan Collins' speech on the Senate floor was so incredible. One of the best I've ever heard. Really? It was like a a lawyer doing a closing summary. Uh, Yeah. And so I think that kind of was where Senate deliberations should be, not where they were in that committee hearing. 
Senator, I've often said uh, not when will this um, lack of civility uh, end, but how. Who's, who's going to take the lead? I mean, who's it incumbent upon to move this thing forward to where we don't, we're not you know, just ripping each other apart? Is this just a function of the midterm elections combined with this, with this confirmation? Uh, yes, yes, but also if you think about it, there are one or two that were particularly egregious. Um, and so I will say there's actually a fair number of things that are happening on a bipartisan basis. Yesterday, excuse me, the night before the final Brett Kavanaugh hearing, I had a resolution regarding suicide prevention that passed unanimously, and I did it with Chris Murphy, a liberal uh, senator from Connecticut. He and I also had legislation go through on mental health about a year ago. And so uh, one example, we, on a bipartisan basis, we just did um, the uh, Federal Aviation Administration reauthorization, which included benefits for Louisiana that I was able to get in. Uh, all the folks affected by the great floods of 2016 having problems with duplication of benefits. Right. And so, so that was a bipartisan bill that got through this week. Uh, and then yesterday we approved 15 judges, uh, again, on a bipartisan basis, including one in the Western District of Louisiana, Mike Juno, great guy. He was the arbiter for the BP oil spill right. uh, and got him through, again, on a bipartisan basis. So we look at the conflict, but sometimes uh, miss the fact that so much is being done on a bipartisan basis. Absolutely. want to thank you for your uh, uh, joining us today. Really appreciate the opportunity. I understand. I think y'all are going on break. Y'all thought y'all were going on break before, and it didn't happen. So I hope y'all are able to, to go on break and get uh, spend some time with your family. Well, and spend some time with constituents, too. Thanks, you. Absolutely. All righty. Senator Bill Cassidy uh, joined us, and uh, we really appreciate his time, and uh, have a great weekend. We'll be right back. We want to hear from you, 260-1870 or Texas at 870-870. This is Newell on WWL.